Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mario Baldi, a distinguished technologist at Pensando Systems. He is a very active member of uh, the community that works on programmable data planes, and I'm very excited to hear his talk about uh, programmable data plane architecture for the network edge. Uh, Mario, please take it away. Thank you very much, Mina. Yes, this work was done together with my two colleagues, Diego Kravnikov and uh, Silvano Guy. And uh, um, I'm going to describe, uh, as Mina was saying, the architecture of a data plane to be used at the network edge, so uh, in hosts. Uh, so let me say what are the goals, uh, which also um, uh, make up the outline of this talk. First of all, I want to uh, talk about implementing distributed services at the edge of the network. Um, so again, network in um, hosts. And uh, in particular, the, the platform that at Pensando we have developed for this purpose. Uh, then I want to talk about the architecture of the distributed services card that is at the um, center. It's the centerpiece of this platform. And then take a few representative use cases to see how this architecture can actually support them. And uh, uh, finally, look at the performance that we can achieve in the implementation of those use cases on this card. So as I was saying, let me uh, tell you a couple of uh, uh, things about the distributed services platform in which we uh, envision this card could be used. So um, the, 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 the card we are talking about is a host adapter, is installed in hosts, and is characterized by having including um, inside a P4 programmable processor. So we envision that uh, a number of those cards will be deployed in various hosts in the network. Potentially, uh, um, all of the hosts in a, um, uh, in a uh, data center. Uh, that's not mandatory, but the more hosts we have supporting the card, the, the more services and more um, uh, widely we can implement. And uh, on those cards, we can implement services that can be network services like uh, NAT, uh, load balancers. Um, we can implement security services like stateful firewalls, encryption um, uh, offload, uh, TLS offload, micro segmentation, or storage services like uh, remotization of storage. And finally, telemetry and visibility services. We can collect telemetry information from the card uh, about the traffic being generated and received by hosts. Um, and uh, um, uh, we can uh, also monitor the traffic on the host, so capture traffic. And the idea is that those services execute on the cards in a distributed fashion, but they are managed in a centralized way from a uh, management system, which uh, in our architecture we call policy and services manager. And we have implemented such a policy service manager, but the card can work with any other controller that uh, the end user might want to uh, implement. As an example, the controller we have implemented offers the possibility of uh, configuring those cards through policies, manage the life, life cycle of those cards. It can be uh, all, of the, all of that management and control can be automated through a REST API. And um, we provide um, observability services by collecting telemetry and uh, possibly, as I said, collecting traffic for troubleshooting for security reasons. And we integrate with an ecosystem of tools, like for example, analytics tool, to better understand what, what's happening within the network and what's happening with the workloads that are using the network what performance those workloads see from the network. So now, uh, focusing, zooming into the card, these uh, cards which we call distributed services card or DSC, as I said, this is a host adapter. So as such, it has a PCIe interface connecting to the host. And on the other hand, it has ethernet ports to interconnect to the network, usually to a top of rack switch. Um, our cards have two ethernet ports. We have two models of card, either with 25 gig ports or with 100 gig ports. It then can be broken out to different speeds. 
Now, packets are, for example, received through the ports and they are stored into packet buffer. The packet buffer has a queuing system and uh, for packets that are being transmitted through the card, the queuing system provides QoS functionalities, various scheduling algorithms. And uh, again, if we look at, uh, for example, a packet that is coming from the network interface after being received into the packet buffer, it can be processed by a packet processing data plane, which is fully P4 programmable. There we can do all of the necessary um, processing on packets and then either forward them back through the interfaces, send them back to the packet buffer for being sent out, or they can be, if they need to be received by the host, they can be uh, forwarded to the host through an interconnection between this processing data plane and the host. Now, similarly, packets that are transmitted from the host can be processed initially by this data plane before being sent out. Now, the interesting aspect of this architecture is that in addition to the P4 programmable processing data plane, we also have a ARM complex with a number of ARM cores, which can also process those packets when needed, for example, to perform more sophisticated processing. And we have a number of service processing offloads, which are um, uh, specialized hardware components uh, to perform specific functionalities like uh, um, encryption or decryption, um, computation of, uh, of um, checksums, uh, um, compression and decompression. So typically uh, pr processing intensive uh, um, tasks that can be um, better and faster performed in hardware. And last but not least, we have a memory, a significantly sizable memory. We have two versions, four gigabyte or eight gigabyte. And, you know, again, it might be very important to have um, availability of this amount of memory because for many services or applications that we might want to um, develop, uh, implement on the card, might be important to um, be able to store state, a large amount of state information. So again, this is the architecture of the card. And in the remainder of the talk, I would like to see how we can take advantage of those various elements in this application, in this uh, architecture to implement um, network services or applications. And to do this, I want to take a number of sample use cases that I think are particularly representative. We are gonna go through three use cases. So the first one is, TLS offload, offload of uh, transport layer security. Now, I think of floating protocol processing is a typical application of smart mix. Uh, now, this card is not exactly a smart mix. The DSC is not a smart mix. It's, it's, a, it's a host adapter with a large number of functionalities. So if you wish, it's a, it's a subset of a smart mix. But since it can be used to send and receive packets and it's sitting in a host, it, it performs also what typically a NIC does. And so we can look at, at this card to, to implement the typical things that are implemented on smart NICs like offload. And the reason why we, we do offload usually is, as the name says, to, to take uh, away those uh, tasks from the CPU of the host and, and, and the memory of the host. So usually we, we do this for applications that require a significant amount of resources in terms of memory and CPU. And I think TLS offloading is a great example of this because in TLS offloading, we need to terminate, uh, we need to do TCP connection management. So open and close TCP connection. We have to handle the state of TCP connection, um, perform flow control, congestion control, uh, um, Taking, um, taking, uh, keeping track of the state means also having a significant amount of memory. We need to store packets in the transmitter so that they can be retransmitted if needed. Uh, and then in the case of TLS, we need to uh, perform TLS session management, which again is, um, requires a certain amount of, of memory and of processing, but especially also we need to encrypt and authenticate the data that is being transmitted. And this can be um, significant uh, load from the, the processing point of view on, on, the, on the CPU. So the idea is to do these in our DSCs. 
And how can we implement TLS offload uh, in, uh, for example, in a host adapter? Well, one possible way of doing this, and it's not the only way, is by implementing a proxy. So basically, uh, instead of having, for example, a uh, web browser that connects to a web server using HTTPS, we have the web browser using a regular HTTP um, session, so a TCP connection to port 80 towards a local proxy. And in our case, this proxy would be running on the card, on the DSC. Uh, this proxy is going to terminate that HTTP session and create a TCP, an HTTP session with the web server uh, using TLS on a different port. Okay, so using um, a secure connection session with the with the server. So consequently, this proxy is going to needs to handle the TCP termination towards the browser and towards the server, and it needs to handle the TLS session towards the server, encryption, decryption, and so on and so forth. So significant amount of work. And how do we map these on our DSC architecture? So the idea is that usually packets that are transmitted and received through the interfaces are processed um, completely in the packet processing data plane, the P4 programmable packet processing data plane. So there we have a P4 program that is handling normally packets. Now, when um, we detect that the packet is, uh, the packet contains one of the initial messages to open a TCP connection or to initiate a TLS session, we forward that packet to an, one of the ARM cores. And, there we have some software running that uh, is processing the um, connection setup and um, um, in the TLS session setup. So it checks the certificates and uh, does whatever needs to be done. Once the TCP connection and the TLS sessions uh, session are um, set up, the, the software on the ARM processor installs necessary state in the data plane processing in the P4 programmable pipeline. And from there on, subsequent packets of that TLS session are handled completely in the P4 pipeline. So the, the uh, proxying functionality, the termination of the TCP session, the um, handling of the flow control, congestion control, uh, is all handled here uh, by a P4 program. Um, with the advantage of being able to leverage the service processing offload engines to encrypt, decrypt, uh, authenticate, verify the, the message digest of the data. So this is a very uh, efficient implementation because uh, the, the pipeline and the processing offload will be able to perform those operations in, at, wide, uh, at wide rate. And, uh, the ARM complex is, which is obviously slower, it's executing software, is being involved only in the setup phase. Uh, not only will uh, we we'll get maximum throughput by working uh, for all of the rest of the packets in the processing data plane pipeline, but also will minimize delay and jitter. Now, this was the first use case I wanted to look at. Another use case I want to look at is uh, um, in NVMe over, over fabric with TCP transport. So NVMe means non-volatile memory express. And uh, you know, this probably most people know is a, is a standard for um, accessing uh, disks, fast disks like solid state disks. And uh, um, the, the operating system usually has a driver that, that uses this, uh, uh, this solution. NVMe over fabric is used to access disks that are not local but remote. So this, this drawing shows a sem sample setup where the NVMe over fiber target to the right is a remote storage system. And uh, here to the left, we have a host with its own operating system and the operating system has to implement NVMe over fiber. So it will have a remote storage management module an initiator, and then 
the support for the proper transport. And VME over fabric can use different transport transports through the network. Uh, it can use RDMA, remote direct memory access, or it can use TCP. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, and there are, of course, differences. RDMA has its own uh, transport layer. Um, but, you know, again, from a logical point of view, the point here is um, we need within the operating system to implement all of the functionalities to take NVMe commands and transfer them through, um, uh, through the network to, uh, to the remote storage system. And um, if we have a virtualized host, these functionalities can be included in the hypervisor, which is then going to emulate a local storage to the various VMs. So the various VMs will access the storage as if it were local. So they don't need to have support for NVMe over fabric. They just need to have NVMe support. And uh, the, the hypervisor is going to take the NVMe request and uh, use NVMe over fabric to connect to the local storage. Now, again, this is usually implemented in the operating system or in the hypervisor. The idea here is what if we want to take these functionalities and offload them to the DSC? Okay, as I was saying before, we want to use the DSC for all sorts of services, including storage services. This is the case. So those functionalities required to implement the NVMe over fiber are implemented in the DSC. The translation of uh, um, messages, uh, commands coming from the, the, the uh, operating system into NVMe over fabric messages and their transport. So the implementation of the TCP and see and, and point that opens a connection and handles all of the connection state. So again, how is this going to uh, map onto our architecture? Well, I would say again, pretty well. So um, our card is sitting in a host. The NVMe commands are coming in through the PCIe interface and they are processed by a P4 program running on the P4 processing data plane. So this P4 program takes care into translating the NVMe commands in the, into NVMe over fa fabric messages or capsules as they are called. And it can take care of load balancing them across, in, across multiple remote controllers. It encapsulates them in the proper transport, for example, TCP and then takes care of all of the TCP protocol functionalities, the ones I was mentioning before, session handling, and also functionalities like segmentation of, uh, um, of TCP payload into multiple <coughs> messages. Um, and now, with TCP, with the NVMe over fiber, Sometimes we might want to encrypt the data. Sometimes the data that is moving in and out of the disk is sensitive data, so we don't want to transfer it on the network as, uh, uh, as uh, plain data. So uh, sometimes NVMe over fabric also requires encryption and decryption. In the typical deployment, this has to be performed by the host CPU with the consequent load. In our card, we can use our service offloads to perform those operations, verify um, <clears throat> message digest, encrypt, and decrypt. Um, not only, but once we have control of the data that is moving towards the disk, we can even use the card to perform encryption and decryption of the data at rest. So one option could be, let's encrypt the data from the host to the remote disk. The other option is let's encrypt the data so that it's going to be stored, encrypted on the remote disk. And this can be done within the card completely at very, with very high performance at line rate without using any resources in the host. Actually, without even the host knowing that, for example, data is being encrypted before moving it to the disk. By the way, one thing that I forgot to mention is that these, these um, cards can be managed completely through the network. So the card is attached to the host. From the point of view of the host, it's like a regular NIC, but it is fully managed 
through the network. So the host doesn't necessarily need any knowledge of what is going on on the card. The host doesn't need to install any software to support what is going on in the card. This is possible because the card has everything needed inside, including, um, again, general processors for general processing and um, enough memory for implementing many applications. So we have seen one example of a float, uh, so a typical network service, one example of a typical storage service. Let me move now to an example of a security service, an east-west firewall. So what we mean by east-west firewall is it's a firewall that protects the traffic, that, that inspects the traffic that is going between um, servers within a data center. This is a sample data center network. We have a bunch of servers. Usually we use a spine leaf topology in the network and we have flows going between, uh, between uh, hosts, between servers in the data center. So um, why is an east-west firewall particularly challenging? First of all, because east-west traffic uh, is usually uh, has a much larger volume than north-south traffic. And by north-south, I, I mean the traffic that is going out of the data center. So for example, the traffic that's coming from the clients to these servers, while east-west is traffic between the servers, between the various tires of an application. Moreover, because the traffic is usually, is local, applications that are generating the traffic expect a very small latency. Uh, that's not the case with north-south traffic. So with north-south traffic, because anyway, you have the latency introduced by the internet. So firewalls that work with north-south traffic don't have very stringent latency requirements. They can introduce a little bit more latency. It's not a big deal because anyway, the network is going to introduce latency. The same cannot be true for, for east-west firewalling. And finally, for east-west fire, east firewalling, um, appliances are not a good solution. Having an, a, an appliance in the data center that performs the firewall functionality is not a good idea because this means that the traffic between two servers has to go all the way through the data center network to the appliance and then come back, creating what is known as the traffic tromboning effect. So this, this traffic that's going back and forth through the network. So uh, in this, this respect, the DSC is the perfect spot where to implement this, uh, uh, this service, an east-west firewall. The, the DSC is always on the way, on the path of the packets. And uh, consequently, we don't need to create the traffic tromboning effect. We are already on the path. Uh, and uh, um, in order to um, reduce latency, what we can do, th this already, being on the path per se reduces latency because we don't have to go through the network twice. But in order to reduce it even further, what we can do, we can implement a, a firewall solution that is based on flow caching. And this is what I'm going to talk about, um, about here and provide some performance uh, numbers. Uh, so the idea is that we evaluate the, the firewalling rules on the first packet or first few packets of, of a flow. Um, as many packets as we need to be able to evaluate the rule. And once we see that uh, uh, the packets of those flows are allowed, we can install a rule in a flow cache and for the following packet, not process each, uh, not, not um, check the rules on each following packet. So how does something like this map onto the DSC architecture? Again, packets um, are as usual, processed by, um, by the before um, programmable data plane. They come from the host or they come from the network interface and they're processed there. Um, when they belong to a flow that is already known, so that is in the flow cache, they are just forwarded directly to the host or uh, through the um, Ethernet interface. When we um, uh, get a packet that misses the flow cache, there's no entry in the flow cache, then uh, the packet is 
again, just processed by the P4 pipeline, but it's processed more, uh, more in detail by going and matching against the firewall rules to decide what is the action to be taken on the packets of that flow. Do those packets have to be uh, allowed or do they have to be denied and dropped? Once this is determined, the packet together with the corresponding action is passed to, the, to one of the ARM cores that has software that is going to uh, compute uh, the reverse flow. Remember, we want to, maybe I never said it, but we want to implement a stateful firewall. So we want that whenever a flow is admitted in one direction, the corresponding flow in the other direction is being admitted. So if we have flows, for example, initiated within, um, um, within a certain area in the data center and allowed, the flows that are coming from outside should be allowed without having to check any further rules. So we need to install rules for the forward direction and the uh, reverse direction. This is being computed by the ARM complex. The corresponding flow entries are entered into the flow cache and um, uh, at that point the packet is passed back to the pipeline that will process it according to the flow cache and forward it or drop it depending on what needs to be done. And notice that uh, we can do this, um, uh, uh, update the flow cache and then pass back the packet because the ARM core and the packet processing data plane are very tightly integrated. They share the same memory space. So whenever the ARM, uh, the ARM updates the table, the table is found updated in the um, in the data plane. And this is a very important value of this architecture. It's not just combining different modules. It is integrating them in a very effective and uh, uh, flexible way. So, um, so in, this, uh, in this implementation, the installation of flows is the most critical task. Otherwise, packets are just uh, processed by being looked up in a flow cache. It's a you know, very easy uh, task that, that can be um, um, executed very efficiently by a pre for programmable pipeline. And um, so in this work, we have focused on that, particular, on that particular task and we have explored different implementations. We have played around a little bit with the, um, with the code and so we have made the first implementation, which I would call the ARM heavy, which is what I just described. Uh, basically, uh, the, the packets, the initial packets of a flow, uh, the, 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 the following packets are always handled by the flow cache. The initial packets in the ARM heavy implementation, as I just described, are um, processed in the P4 pipeline to match them against the firewall rules. But once we have identified the firewall rule that they match, the corresponding action and the packet are passed to the ARM core that has to pass the packet, create the flow, um, direct and reverse flow entries and install them in the flow cache. Now with this particular implementation, we can achieve 1 million of new flows per second, which, which is already uh, very significant. But we want us to see, can we improve this by leveraging even more the P4 pipeline where we can get maximum performance? And so we, we uh, made a second implementation, which I called ARM Lite, because we use a little bit less the ARM core, where in addition to matching the, the firewall rules in the pipeline, we also use the P4 pipeline to extract the relevant metadata. I mean, obviously this is done uh, in advance as the packets come in. So the P4 pipeline already has all the relevant metadata. And uh, um, what we want to do, we want to um, uh, pass it to the, um, uh, to the ARM core directly. So that the ARM core only needs to compute the forward and uh, reverse flows and install the corresponding entry. So no need to pass again the packet. Again, this is possible thanks to the tight integration be between the pipeline and the ARM core. We can move the metadata 
easily from the pipeline to the ARM core. And performance triplicate. We can achieve up to 3 million packets per second. And right now, it's still work in progress, so I don't have performance results yet, but we are working on a yet, um, in yet another implementation, which I called here pipeline heavy, where not only we extract the relevant metadata in the P4 pipeline, but we also create the entries for uh, the flow cache table. So the forward and reverse entries. And so we expect yet more improvement in the performance. Uh, so I think this, this example is particularly relevant because it's showing how, on the one hand, some unique features that we have in our before programmable pipeline, in the processors and the processing unit, the units that are in that pipeline. And the tight integration between that pipeline and the other elements of the architecture can enable uh, a programmer to really implement quite sophisticated applications at very, very high performance, achieve very high performance. And this is true for this use case. Um, and it's true in different ways also for the previous one. Like when we were seeing the integration between the P4 pipeline and the offloads, the service offloads, like the, the encryption and, and compression offloads. Now talking about performance, a couple more pieces of data on the performance that we can achieve with these firewall uh, applications. So we, we ran a few experiments. In the first one, we used the card in host adapter mode, which is really what I said the card is so far. It's, a, it's an adapter. So the idea is we can, we can install it in a host and, and uh, use the distributed firewall on the, packet, on the path that those packets have from the application to the network or from the network to the application. The way we performed this experiment, we used iPerf on, on two hosts that are um, deploying our card. Again, on the card, we are running the distributed stateful firewall. And uh, um, we have measured the performance in terms of bandwidth, which is represented here by the orange bars uh, in this graph. And you see the bandwidth here. Uh, this graph is uh, showing the aggregated transmit and receive bandwidth. And you can see, and, and we measured it for uh, different sizes of the TCP maximum segment size. So basically for different packet sizes, we use the maximum segment size to force the host to generate packets of, uh, of a certain size. And obviously we can see that uh, with, with very small packets, we cannot achieve a very high bandwidth throughput, but as the packet size increases, we, we achieve wire, wire speed throughput, almost wire, almost wire speed throughput, but you know, again, there is a little bit of overhead. And plus here, the limitation is not necessarily the firewall application in the car. It might be the host or um, uh, it might be the host, either the application running on the host or the operating system stack uh, or some other components within the host. But still, we can achieve almost um, 200 gigabit, gigabit, gigabit per second. Keep in mind that that's what the firewall is processing. And in terms of packets per second, um, uh, obviously, with large packets, we don't achieve high throughput, uh, high number of packets per second because uh, because the, the throughput is uh, um, the amount, the number of packets is limited by the wire speed. But if we operate it, it is with small packets and the and the wire speed is not limiting us, we achieve over 33 million packets per second, which is um, a good throughput. Now, as I said, though performances here might be limited by the host. So we ran another set of experiments in what we call bumping the wire mode. Now, this, this drawing shows what I mean by bumping the wire. So in a host, we, we install our card on the PCI bus, but we use the PCI bus basically only to power the card. Then one of the two interfaces of the card is connected to a regular NIC card, the legacy NIC card, and the other one is connected to the network, to the top of the rack switch. Now, we use this, uh, this setup in the experiments because this way, packets are coming in from, um, from a port and go out to, through another port. They are not coming through the, um, through the, uh, uh, 
to, through the stack protocol stack in the host. But this is not a configuration that is you know just used for experiments. This is a configuration that some um, uh, some users might want to deploy if they have uh, legacy cards that they want to keep for whatever reasons because they have special functionalities or because they are running a legacy operating system that doesn't have the drivers for uh, for a DSC. And so this is a, a configuration that we have seen some, especially some cloud providers are interested in using. And how did we run these experiments? We took two cards, two DSC cards, we connect them back to back through one of their ports, and then we connected the other port through, uh, to a traffic generator, an IXIA traffic generator. So on the one hand, we generate traffic, uh, the traffic goes through the two cards, is received on the other side, and the XIA is measuring um, packets per second, latency, and jitter. And uh, these are the numbers that we got. And again, on the, the cards are running the stateful firewall. Okay, so those cards, each one of those cards is able to run the stateful firewall, the stateful firewall, and process four million packets per second with a latency of just three microseconds and the jitter of just 35 nanoseconds. So I you know, think these are really um, uh, impressive numbers that again are possible thanks to the fact that uh, uh, packets are processed uh, um, on a P4 programmable pipeline that's, uh, that's highly optimized, completely processed there. We can implement fully the firewall there, possibly with, uh, as I said, in the, in the arm heavy implementation with some contribution for the initial packets of the flow by an arm core, but because that arm core is tightly integrated with the pipeline, um, <clears throat> the implementation is, is very, very efficient. So with this, I'm done. And uh, to summarize and to conclude, I've, you know, I gave you an overview of the architecture of a, a, a distributed services card. Um, I've shown how it can be leveraged to implement various uh, services and applications um, that could be uh, used to offload the host, like a TLS offload or, or like in the case of the um, distributed firewall to take those services that were traditionally implemented into, into discrete appliances, take them and distribute them through the network on a bunch of these cards. And, and, and we have seen how we can do this achieving very high performance in terms of throughput, latency, and jitter, and with no performance hit on the host that is uh, hosting the card. The card is working completely independently of the host. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, please fire. Thank you, Mario. This was a very interesting um, presentation. And mm -hmm. I have some, um, some I think, high level questions um, uh, because I think this is one of the uh, kind of first architectures that we see for a programmable um, NIC. I mean, I know it's not a smart NIC, but something that resembles a programmable NIC that can do more than the regular NIC functionality. So I think uh, what I'm curious about is that what, is, what are the main design decisions you made when um, you made kind of created this architecture? So I think one of the things that you kind of uh, focused on a lot was this tight integration between all the modules uh, and this kind of shared memory. But I'm just wondering if there's like if you have more thoughts on that or other uh, kind of major design decisions that you make? Yeah, so first of all, let me uh, put a disclaimer up front. Uh, unfortunately, I did not participate into the design of the card. I'm not a hardware designer. And moreover, I joined, when I joined Pensando, this card was, was designed already. But um, from what I, I, I know and I can understand, uh, th there are a lot of trade-offs. And, and by the way, this is the first generation of this card. We are uh, already working on the next generation because in fact, there are different applications that require different trade-offs. For example, just to give you an example, in the first card, we, um, we decided to use a very high speed uh, technology for the memory. Uh, mm -hmm. But this had uh, cost implications, had uh, size limitations. As I said, we, we can go up to eight gigabyte, but we cannot go more than eight gigabyte. So for example, um, that's, that's one of the, design choices that uh, uh, is going to be revisited in, in, in future versions. Um, then then um, we had to decide, uh, for example, how 
much of the real estate. By the way, let me open a parenthesis here. I, I am saying that uh, uh, what I described is the architecture of the card. In reality, what I described is the architecture of an ASIC that is sitting on the card. I don't know if you right. remember, there was a picture that was showing the card with an ASIC inside. What I described is the architecture of that ASIC. So clearly there we have a certain, uh, a certain amount of real estate. And uh, one of the decisions was how much to devote to the P4 pipeline versus the ARM cores. Because, you know, again, the ARM cores give you much more flexibility in terms of what you can do, uh, the complexity of the processing that you can do, but definitely in terms of performance, the, the pipeline is, is much faster. So there were some, uh, uh, some uh, trade-offs that were chosen there. I cannot go into the very details, but at the end of the story, there are a number of different pipelines. They are connected in certain ways. I, I did not, I could not go, go into the details and they were not relevant with respect to this talk. But, but if you uh, open up that box that was the P4 programmable data plane, there you will see different pipelines that can be used um, in different ways uh, to uh, process packets or even non-packets. We have a generalized concept of pipeline that can process entities that are not necessarily packets um, from the packet buffer to the PCI interface, to the memory and to the offloads and so on. I see. So, so uh, I guess what you're saying is that there's uh, main factors. One of them is, you know, the memory architecture. Um, and the other one is basically still that balance between how much like more general purpose processing you have versus the more specialized processing. Exactly, exactly. Including those offloads, right? You could, you could, there, which offloads to include is a very tough decision because- uh, That was the question. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, by, uh, by leveraging the experience that some of the people on the team have with the market and by talking to, prospective customers, uh, some guesswork was done as to which ones to include. Um, now, as more customers will use it and we'll cover more use cases, we will see which ones are really heavily used, which ones are least, and in future versions, we might, we might rebalance the whole thing. But I have to say that, uh, you know, notwithstanding all of this, the current uh, architecture is, is pretty flexible and uh, um, we have implemented several applications. Again, I gave three as, as examples, but we have many more, and we hope many more will be implemented by, by third parties. We, we, uh, our plan is to open this platform for third parties to, to implement on it, and, uh, and consequently, we hope them to see more and more applications on those. Um, and, and, you know, there will be some limitations, but definitely the, the level of flexibility is, is significant right now. Right. Um, speaking of applications, um, so how would one actually write an application or a program on this card? Yeah, this is a very good question. So um, it's going to be um, uh, it's going to be always two parts: a P4 program that is uh, running on the um, on the data plane on the P4 data plane. Let's call it the fast data plane, and a um, a program that is running on the ARM complex. So uh, on the ARM complex, we, we have, uh, um, we are running Linux. In reality, someone using the card could run whatever they want. And, uh, um, and there we, uh, we run our application, applications as, as Linux processes. So you can write them as native C programs or you can use a, a Python script and, and you run your application over there. Um, so, when one wants to program this card, they can do it. They can do it at various levels. They can take some prepackaged P4 programs for the pipeline and just work on the uh, software running on the arms to sort of customize or stitch them together. If you wish, they they can uh, implement the control part of the program on the ARM processor and uh, use uh, our P4 pipeline. Uh, program, or uh, they can decide to go ahead and, and write their own P4 program and uh, P4 code, and then 
uh, obviously at that point they have to write their own um, software on the ARM core. But you have always these, these two components, which one, if you want, you can take already pre-made by us or by a third party again. Right, right. Um, so, it's, so you're still saying like at this point, like people have to think in a distributed way about their program. They have to have a separate component for the ARM cores and for the P4 program, for the P4 programmable part. Do you envision it would be possible? I mean, I, I know it's like this is a research question that is kind of going around, but do you think it's possible to have, you know, one uh, high level language and then um, have a compiler like, or to automate this process or in your um, experience seeing this kind of applications do you think that like to get that performance you actually need it to be a manual process? Well, uh, okay, sure. I, I think uh, uh, a compiler, I guess as always, will always have some sort of a performance penalty compared to writing native code, right? You know, I mean, in general. But I think uh, uh, such a compiler would, would really be uh, very powerful. Now, would it be possible? To be honest, um, I never really thought about it, but, uh, but I don't see why not. I mean, I think this is a very, this is a general question that applies to, to any P4 programmable system, right? Uh, you always have the, the, the P4, code and the, and the controller code. So can we create a, a high level language that describes both and then generates both? Um, uh, honestly, again, I, I never thought about it, but I think it's, it's something worth investing. And uh, I, I, maybe, maybe you cannot implement any applications, any application that way, but I would say for some applications, it should be possible with some limitations probably, but it should be possible. Right, yeah, I was wondering if um, kind of implementing applications on this, um, on this card, you've seen some pattern of, you know, this kind of uh, processing is usually, you know, it, it's better to be done on the ARM core versus that kind of processing is better fitted um, to the P4 program ARM core. Like if there's some patterns, maybe that is something that can be automated. Yeah. Um, Yes, I see your point. I, I think at this point, uh, the experience that, uh, that, that, that we have is, is not uh, big enough to, uh, to really identify those patterns and, and take advantage of it. But I would say, um, for, for sure, a path, there is a pattern, or yeah, there is a pattern which is uh, things that are more complicated and that require I mean, we know what the limitations of a P4 pipeline in general are, right? You cannot handle um, um, iterations. Although in ours, we came to a certain level because our processors have a, to a certain level, they, could, can, they can perform some, uh, some iterations. But, but because, you know, a pipeline by definition has a, pipe, a pipeline operation, we cannot, uh, um, we cannot spend too much time on any one of the operations. So for those operations that require spending more time or a, an unpredictable amount of time, those you want to do them on the ARM cores. And otherwise you try to do everything in the, in the P4 uh, pipeline. Um, so that's, that's the macro distinction I, I would make. But uh, uh, what you were saying, I think requires having a, a larger set of cases to then be able to uh, automatically put them in one or the other box. Hopefully as people write more applications for this. Yeah, part. yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's what we need. And then at some point, uh, um, go to that level. Of course, we have our P4 compiler, uh, but, uh, but having a higher level compiler, that, that would be a very, very interesting idea. Right. So uh, kind of from what you said, and also I think in your talk, you were talking about the parts of the functionality that you implement in the P4 pipelines. It seems like that's kind of an enhanced P4 programmable pipeline. There seems to be some extra stuff. So can you just comment on that a little bit or explain that a little bit more? Yes, definitely. And actually, let me do some advertising here. There's going to be a panel um, in the context of the P4 expert roundtables where uh, we will talk exactly about these. We will uh, focus um, together with a colleague of mine. Um, John Cruz, we will talk about uh, uh, some of the enhancement that we have brought to our pipeline and we, we look at it with some uh, use cases and code, uh, code snippets. Um, 
but yeah, so one, one difference, for example, uh, one, one enhancement that we have uh, in, introduced is the capability of uh, modifying table entries from within the data plane. This is- uh, And you mentioned that too, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, this is important. For example, an application like the, the stateful firewall, of course, you need that. Uh, that was the last level, which was supposed to be faster, right? The fastest right, one. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So um, modify entries. Um, the other, um, another um, set of, uh, of uh, enhancements is related to the fact that the, if you uh, remember uh, the architecture, the P4 pipeline is sitting between the Ethernet interfaces and the PCI right. bus. So that P4 pipeline is not just processing packets. Like if you think of a switch, you, you have a packet coming in, you have a packet going out. So you process a packet, you, you generate, not generate, but you output a packet. In an in a adapter, you, you process a packet, you output something else that has to go to the host. What the host is, is taking is not a packet is the result of processing a packet. If you, if you think, uh, if you offload uh, uh, TCP segmentation, which is one of the use cases we'll talk about in that, in that panel, uh, you need to take several packets, put them together, and, and deliver the content to the host. Vice versa, you, you get the content, you need to uh, break it up. So we needed some uh, new functionalities to deal with the communication between the, the um, card and the host. So in, in other words, uh, to functionalities to perform transfer of data from the card to the host to work on the PCIe uh, bus. Right. Okay, so this required the extensions to the traditional P4. And that is done in the enhanced P4, not the ARM cores, not the... Um like the services that people want. Right, we, we, we want to do that in, P4, in the P4 pipeline because like this we can get performance. Right. And, and you know, um, about this, again, we'll talk about this in, in, that, in that panel, but uh, um, we, we are working with the rest of the community uh, to, def to uh, possibly define a PNA, a program a portable right. NIC architecture, right? We have the PSA, we don't yet have a PNA and uh, um, we had started working some time ago with it, and then it sort of slowed down. And now we are we are, we are starting the work again. I mean, as you very well know, because we're <laughs> the, the meetings. Uh, but I'm saying it for the others. And and so first of all, I think we 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 want to convince the community um, that uh, uh, it might be beneficial to have some architectural uh, changes. And then once we have um, once we have those, we can look at also some possible language changes. Right. And again, uh, the idea is look at the use cases, look at the way um, possible way we have done it, po possible other ways of doing it, and see if this can be beneficial to everyone and to be included in the P4 standards. Right. Well, thank you very much. This is all from me. I don't know if there's any um, last comments, final comments, or remarks you want to have. No, thank you very much, Mina. Those were very interesting questions, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, anyone that will uh, um, look at this uh, at this video recording, and uh, uh, hope uh, soon to be able to meet in person again. Right. Oh, yeah. In person again. It's great to have them online; they are available to everyone. But it's also great to to be able to be in the room and chat. Right. 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 Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, this was really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you.